And as an only child, Betty Branch moved 15 times before graduating high school. She was often alone and her earliest memories are of making things. Doll clothes, tree houses, creek rafts and vegetable gardens. As a young wife, her creations continued and included eight children and late nights painting on the kitchen table. I can visualize that as well. And when her youngest entered kindergarten, Betty enrolled at Hollins College. Betty earned both her BA and MA in studio art from Hollins University, proficient in both painting and sculpture. Betty in her first 30 years of her career focused on the female form and defined female rites of passage in both traditional and unorthodox media. Bronze, stone, fiber, ceramic, terracotta, earthenware, and straw. And we'll see many of those examples as we tour her studio. In subsequent decades, her sculpture has included numerous public monuments and commissions, and a strong fascination with the myth and form of the crow and raven. Betty's works, both small and monumental, are included in private, corporate, university, and museum collections in the US and abroad. She maintains a gallery in downtown Roanoke, Virginia, which I know many of us have visited, and we look forward to that again. And as we look forward to this year and next year, the Tama Museum of Art um, is honored to be able to present and work with Betty Branch on a retrospective exhibition that will be on view in 2022. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Betty Branch and welcome her to our curated cribs and, um, and we'll start that studio tour. We are looking at the outside of my studio and gallery. I'm on Norfolk Avenue, just a couple of blocks down from the Taubman Museum. When I bought the building in 1987, it was a railroad warehouse and it was full of salvage. It had holes in the roof and pigeons and their droppings everywhere. But it also had a railroad siding and that was right at the back door. I could just imagine winching large pieces of marble straight from the train into the studio. And I'll have to say it was a big disappointment that shortly after I bought it, the siding was removed. In making repairs for the building, it was important to me to maintain the sense of that original space. And after replacing the roof, about all I did was clean and put up a baffle or two to separate areas. My first studio was a third floor walk up on Campbell, where desperate to have a place of my own and with little money of my own, I eventually traded my landlord, Jimmy Trinkle, sculpture for rent. And Jimmy's girl was born. Come in. We'll start our tour in the entrance gallery. The arrangement of sculpture in each of the galleries is very eclectic. Concept, dates, and medium are all subject to aesthetic presentation. This is Laughing Crow, one of four ink paintings of expiation. We're now looking at Small Goddess, a sculpture I originally carved in marble. I just could not bear to part with the image and before it was sold, had a mold made over it and was able to cast a small addition in bronze. <clears throat> I chose a patina for the bronze <clears throat> that I thought looked a lot like stone. It was the study of the goddess culture that drew me to the imagery. And I see in this piece a tribute to the goddess in every woman. I can remember being on a train to Carrara, Italy and drawing in my sketchbook, knowing that one of these drawings would be the sculpture I would carve that year. And Betty, can you tell us the story about the first marble sculpture that you carved? 
Well, I had gone to Carrara in Italy in 1984 because I had heard of a marble carving studio there. I had arrived unannounced and somehow managed to convey to the person on the other side of a very tiny opening in the door that I wanted to carve marble. Amazingly, they set up a corner workstation for me and someone brought me a small piece of marble. Now that was not what I had in mind and I asked for something larger. Soon after, a huge, the huge wooden doors opened and a large piece of marble arrived. The oldest artisani came over with a rusty set of carving tools and I began my journey in marble. At the end of the day, the same man came and took the old tools away and gave me a set of new sharp tools. I took this as a sign of his respect for my ability, that I was doing good. Those first few days in Carrara were absolutely magical. And this is the first piece of marble, that the first sculpture, sculpture that I carved there. I call this piece Young Firefighter. Um, it is an example of a highly figurative work where many small details are noted. Small Goddess is an example of reductive simplicity. The Young Firefighter, a good example of the detail I can get in the additive process, working with clay or wax. These two pieces show very different approaches to my making of sculpture. The Young Firefighter is the first study I presented to the Royal Firefighters Association when the call for a memorial went out. This idea was rejected on the basis that he was too young to represent the whole body of firefighters. I presented a second study, which was accepted. In this photo, I'm working on the clay for the fallen firefighter memorial that um, we see the finished memorial in front of the transportation museum just a couple of blocks down on Salem Avenue. We're passing Totem Crow as we go on our way to Bent Torso. Bent Torso was one of the first a series of three terracotta torsos. I was interested in seeing how far I could take the female form toward abstraction before it no longer read as female. And this was the only one of that series that I cast in bronze. Now, Betty, we've passed a number of your crows as we've um, toured through your studio. And I'd love to hear a story about them and their inspiration. About a year before I made my first crow, I wrote a poem and it tells the story of me and the crows. King of the Crows, 1988. There's an awesome din in the meadow. The crows are mourning their king. Their bullet cries lodge in my head. I knew all along that prejudice was licensed to kill. I knew it when I explained to Bill and Tom why I needed a gun to shoot crows. I knew it the first time I raised the gun from the kitchen window and Bonnie was sitting in the dining room. That time, because she was there, I could not pull the trigger. But the gun was there, a target too. We had sported a bit from the long bench on the front porch at dusk to see who could hit the bullseye. The gun was not the greatest, nor we as marksmen. No one scored high except by accident. We pretty much agreed. Bill carried the gun in his car a few times to the mailbox and back or out on Sunday morning to 6.30 Bible study, but he didn't kill any crow. This morning, gloriously alone, quiet, still, silver sun on patio, I lay down to peace and the raucous sound of crows, not in the meadow, not in the front yard, but in the sanctity of my fenced, locked, sunlit terrace. Enraged, I went for the gun. The slamming door dislodged the crows from back to front and I in hot pursuit. Down the yard and out of range they flew, stopped, black, 
ugly, ungainly antagonists on the front slope into the car, gun, and I, down the drive for better aim and fire. The big black crow flew up, then faltered and fell back. I aimed and fired again. The pellets hit the stiff black feathers, absorbed or fell away. The crow half hopped, half dragged himself down the hill. Me firing and hearing that dull dry feather thud of pellet, still the crow would not fall. There was no sound in the meadow and no way for me to finish what I'd begun. Much of my work is of children. This bronze, named Friends 2, captures the moment of saying goodbye to a beloved pet duck that was being sent away to the zoo. We're now going into the office gallery where some of my smallest pieces are on display. This is Climbing Boys and Icarus. And there are many small studies I made for larger sculptures in this room. Called Mother's Three, this sculpture is one of a series of four that I made of mother and children. Now, Betty, this is very intriguing, this sculpture here. Can you tell us the story of this particular piece? I can. I had just brought it back from the foundry and I was proudly displaying it to my youngest when her eyes filled with tears and she said, Mama, there's something wrong with it. And I said, what's wrong with it, Bonnie? And she pointed to each figure of a child saying, here's a child and here's a child and here's a child. And then she turned the piece. And when she came to the back, she said, look, here's another child and another, but there's no room for the mother. Now, I'm the artist, the mother of eight children who made the piece, but I did not see the metaphor that I had left no room for the mother. This acrylic painting was done very, very quickly as a kind of exorcism. In the midst of creating other crows in bronze, painting one being crucified or burning like a phoenix was a great release. Its title is Crow Ascending. I'm pretty sure that the best of my art is made when I have a strong emotional response to something. It keeps me in the moment, it keeps me excited and in the beginner's mind. We're now moving into the front gallery. This is a much larger space that contains sculpture, painting, prints, and also photographs. Well, we can really see the diversity in your work as, as we view uh, from the stone to the marble to the bronze. Can you speak to which artists inspire you? Michelangelo and Rodin. Later, Maiol, Naguchi, and Manzu were the sculptures that I most admired. And there was Leonard Baskin. His raptors excited my crows. I had a visceral response to his work. It was a kind of kickstart for my thinking at the time and was very exciting. I actually own one of his paintings. He died in 2003 and I really regretted that I had made no effort to meet him. The same was true for Manzu, who died while I was in Italy. Um, the Italian sculptor, Luisa Granero, had said, simplicity is difficult to come up with. It's being able to establish the distinction between the truth and the anecdote, something that expresses the maximum significance by use of minimum means. I really like that. It's exciting to me to reduce the busyness of figurative work to a greater simplicity. It changes what could be a very literal vision into a more lyrical one. 
And this bronze figure, La Pensia Rosa, is a good example. I would like to point out that four other branches also exhibit in the gallery. Above the bronze summer dream, we see a Patrick Branch oil titled Male Nude. When we're on the second floor, we'll see more of the work of Patrick, Sally, Polly, and Bonnie. This bronze is called Ringleader. I can't quite remember how a perfectly dignified horse got up on the ring, but I like it a lot. And that first perfectly dignified horse paid for a trip to Italy. This bronze of a child being carved from a lump of clay and this piece and Emma and the, the sculpture after it were modeled by two of my granddaughters. This is the process of, for grace, for a moment of grace. I'm uh, using clay and wax to sculpt. In the photo on the left, I have taken on the, the work to, on the, I'm sorry, on the photo on the right, I've taken the finished work to the foundry and we see how it looks after the bronze has been poured into a mold with gates, vents and sprues a little like an alien, I think. Once the bronze is completely cool, saws and drills will be used to remove that foundry mold. The foundry process is very involved and very labor intensive. After spending three to six months creating the original art, the foundry process takes about the same amount of time to complete a sculpture, depending on the size and complexity of the piece. In Emma, we have a tired little girl at the end of a long day at the beach, or maybe after a bath. With eight children, in-laws, and grandchildren, I never want for models. <laughs> Marble is my favorite medium partly because the material is so beautiful and partly because carving stone narrows my margin of options. And the reductive process focuses my mind and hand in a way that the additive does not. This piece, Materna to Rosa, is carved from the beautiful Rosa Portuguesa marble and was exhibited in Paris, France. There's a Bonnie Branch photograph called Forest on the far wall. <clears throat> of all my sculpture making, the nests are the closest I come to a working meditation. I think because there's no clear plan for each, no two alike, they evolve in a very seductive, mindless way and the possibilities are endless. Patrick Ranch paintings on the wall there. The box. And a painting of Sally's that we're not able to see, I think, for the light. There she is. These two bronzes are called Fire Dancers 2 and Fire Dancer 3. When we get to the second floor, we'll see the original marbles and hear their story. In a departure from the Mother series, Mother's Four is a bronze of mother, father, and child. The mother and father melded as one in love for the child. We now move into the back gallery, another of Patrick's paintings. Some of you may know this bronze outside the South County Library of a little boy holding the world of reading in his hands, a book, a friend for life. And here are some photos of that process. 
In the left photo, you see me working on the clay figure of the boy. In the photo on the right, I'm in the foundry directing the placement of the boy, which now is in bronze onto a stainless steel ring to be welded. It may be that this marble striding woman best expresses my sense of autonomy and freedom. Isabel, an edition of six bronzes, is in the collection of the Taubman Museum, also Brook Green Gardens, South Carolina, and in private collections in Florida and Northern Virginia. The inspiration and model for Isabel was a young teenage friend of one of my daughters that I saw sunning by the pool. This newest of the crow bronzes, the collector, brings together a sense of earlier crows, seer, oracle, totem, and trophy crow. All of the crows are created in direct wax, each one therefore becoming a unique bronze. On the wall is Gaia, the bronze casting of the first marble I ever carved. Here are the bronzes dancing and stepping out. <clears throat> My first granddaughter, Lara, modeled for the bronze sculpture Flower Girl. She was wearing her dress as a flower girl in her uncle's wedding. <clears throat> I love the contrast of the flower girl fountain between the smooth bronze of the sculpture and the rough steel of the basin. Behind her, we see a painting by Polly Branch. Another. And Betty, you're, you're definitely a prolific artist as we, as we view your artwork. Have you ever you know, experienced artist block and how do you overcome that? I have, I have experienced artist block. I just force myself to sling a brush or pour over old sketchbooks. The time I had my longest artist block when all I could do in the studio for three months was water the plants. I forced myself to paint images of crows very quickly that I never intended to keep just to loosen me up and break the spell. I like working on two or three sculptures at a time. It doesn't matter if in the same medium or not. Being able to leave one thing when there's a problem and go to a completely different thing keeps me from getting stuck. Then when I go back to the one with the problem, it is more easily solved. Study for Once Upon a Time is a small bronze and the most popular piece in the gallery. The life-size bronze is in the collection of the Roanoke Main Public Library in a library in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, a sculpture garden in South Carolina and private collections in Tennessee and Florida. This is my most recent project, Eagle Wing, is a piece planned for a gravestone monument. The wax is almost ready to go to the foundry to be cast into bronze. And here we have Warrior, a painted bronze. This small bronze dancer two mirrors the life-size unique marble sculpture dancer in the collection of the Taubman. Here I was in Nicoli Studios in Italy, beginning the work of dancer and of fire dancer Nero. And here we see another angle of these same marbles. In this photo, I'm beginning the final polishing of Dancer 3, Fire Dancer 3. And this one is called Fire Dancer Nero, 
highly polished finished piece. Called Best Friends, this piece is the study for the seven and a half foot tall bronze grouping, a game of fetch. This was installed in the gardens of St. Francis of Assisi service dogs. It is a memorial commissioned as a gift to that organization. And here are some interesting process photos of the armature for that sculpture. In these photos, you see the very beginning of the sculpture. In the one on the left, I'm building up the armature by almost any means that will hold clay or wax. That can be, in this case, styrofoam and then insulation foam gave a somewhat uniform surface to work on. Polly Branch was the sculptor for the dog, both in the maquette we just saw and in the finished bronze. This is an oil landscape painted by Sally Branch titled Anthony's Knob. We're now in the upstairs galleries. This is Samurai, an interlude. The original marble here is of Fire Dancer 2, and in the background, there is Fire Dancer 3, both of which we saw in bronze on the first floor. These pieces were conceived in Italy in a small room by flickering candlelight. As I modeled the small studies in clay, their shadows danced on the far wall, and I was absolutely enchanted. We saw one of Patrick Branch's oil paintings on the first floor. In this section of the gallery, <clears throat> a number of his oils, watercolors, and drawings are displayed. <clears throat> a plein air painter, many of Patrick's works depict Vermont and Virginia scenes. Polly Branch works in many different mediums. She works in both sculpture and painting. This figure, reclining figure, reduce, reuse, is made of household packaging waste, string, brown paper bags, glue, and water. And here are more of her paintings. These porcelain figures are called All Fall Down. Betty, can you share the story of these porcelain figures, All Fall Down? This was a piece I created after I came home one time from Italy. I was eager to tell my mother about my time there, but she could hear nothing I had to say. She was so obsessed about news of the pool hall gang rape of a woman in Massachusetts. I was greatly impacted and immediately sketched figures, some of them as the gingham dog and calico cat with sawdust falling out from the childhood story. And then I ask a potter friend to throw for me a large number of cylinders in porcelain clay and from them fashion these female figures in less than a week. These broken vessels have no mouths to cry out and no feet to run away. You may be familiar with the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Shipwrecked Jason sent his men two by two to find water. None returned. So he set out himself and found a dragon guarding the spring and his men all dead. His guardian angel instructed him to slay the dragon, pull its teeth, plow the earth and plant the teeth. 
New warriors sprang up from the seeds, mightier than the first. These porcelain and terracotta dragon's teeth are my women warriors. This is a plaster of Martin Luther. <clears throat> Polly and I worked on this commission together in 2017. The bronze is installed in front of the Krager Center at Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia. Bonnie Branch, a photographer, <clears throat> has landscapes, nudes, and florals in this gallery. You can see some actual trees in the space. They were there from a previous installation of three by five foot photos of trees, one of which you saw briefly downstairs. Bonnie wanted the viewer to feel immersed in the forest while looking for the trees. Take the Wheel holds this space as we walk on our way to Sally Branch's gallery. Sally shows watercolors, oil and acrylic paintings, as well as monoprints. Sally is inspired by nature, by our mountains, the beach, and her own garden. Here's a dragon's tooth, this one in bronze. These photos are of a performance piece I did at Hollins College in 1987. Woman Wheel was a pre-dawn ritual gathering of women on a hill above Hollins. I had wanted to create a Native American medicine wheel as a large earth painting, but I realized I really shouldn't appropriate that sacred image. And I instead created a woman wheel. My daughters and women friends circled and we sang the sun up that morning. We mourned our losses and celebrated our joys and created a warm spot on the earth made cold by war and turmoil. Another performance piece started as a series of nine large burlap pieces. As you can see, I used any means necessary to create these figures filled with straw. This 15 foot mother was displayed in the Jacob Javits Center at Expo in New York in 1985. <clears throat> and some were exhibited at Virginia Western Community College. And there were others. Now, Betty, I'm very curious, where are those other mothers now? After being in several exhibitions, they stood in the stairwell of my first studio on Campbell Avenue. One day I brushed against them and moths flew out and a mouse. I knew I couldn't keep them. The thought of their being stuffed into a garbage truck was unbearable. I had read of the outlawed Indian practice called Suti. When a man died in India, his wife, no matter how young, was drugged and laid on his funeral pyre to be burned to death with him. I determined that any fires I stepped into would be of my own setting. These mothers would go out in a blaze. I gained access to a deep quarry lake in Roanoke County where I staked the burlap mothers to a wooden raft. And then I set them afire. 
It was a glorious end. It was a ritual fire. I saw a phoenix in the flames. And here is a glimpse of one of the workrooms, a look behind the curtain where some of this all happens. This is the first space in the warehouse that I used as a studio. I hung plastic for walls and there was a kerosene heater to keep me warm. As time passed, I built real walls and I bought a gas heater and made two other studio areas. But this room <clears throat> remains the center a kind of staging area where ideas develop and I sometimes even spend the night. Many of the things on the walls are from another time or one of a kind terracotta masks from exhibits I've been in and some are ideas yet to be made. Thank you for pulling back that curtain and showing us the magic behind the curtain as you described it. And you found success in the art world and many emerging artists ask that question of how did you learn the business side of being an artist? Can you share that with us? Well, it was little by little for sure. Mostly importantly, only show pieces you love. If you love what you've made, then the possibility of someone else's loving it is pretty good. Inform yourself of local, national, and international art markets and visit galleries. What are the prices for work similar to yours? Then you figure your costs and set your prices. Advertise by any means possible. Join art associations. They will give you exhibit opportunities and information in your field. Keep abreast of calls for art by subscribing to online sites. Be fearless. Well, and any last words of advice for aspiring artists uh, that you would like to share, Betty? Just that once you've mastered something, try something new. Try new things, materials, tools, methods. Most of all, stay in the beginner's mind. 